All right. Today is Wednesday, November 3rd. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and let's dive right into it. In focus tonight, we're going to talk about the madman, the delusional madman, Jerome Powell. Then we'll talk about the Virginia elections and the impacts on the economy. And lastly, we're going to go over some macro data. And let's start right away with the delusional madman, Jerome Powell. As expected, he did not issue any interest rates hikes or any guideline for the left off. He did, however, taper, as expected, the 15 billion dollars and then another 10 billion dollars in december and as expected of course mr powell remains a delusional madman dazed and confused while most americans see what's going on in reality with inflation surging out of whack prices surging out of whack the supply chain woes the extremely hot employment market with people quitting jobs with people staying at home with the labor shortage all of that evidence doesn't matter to Powell, because Powell has no interest at all to do the right thing. His interest is to continue to pump the stock market and the real estate market higher and higher and higher. He's only extending the courtesy of tapering right now only $15 billion because he has to. The problem is Mr. Powell will find himself behind the curve. He will be forced to follow a stricter policy of monetary tightening and perhaps jacking interest rates higher and sooner than expectations. And this will be devastating for the economy. So why didn't Powell at least issue a guideline for the left off in interest rates? Here is his answer. That's a decision for the committee. I, I, would, I would put it to you this way. By the, when we reach maximum employment, when we reach a statement, a state where labor market conditions are, maximum, are at maximum employment in the committee's judgment, it's very possible that, that the inflation test will already be met. We're aware that that language sounds, it sounds a little out of touch with what's going on, but uh, you know, we're not at maximum employment. When, when, the, when, that, when that is the case, We'll look to see whether the inflation test is met, and there's a good chance that it will be if you look at, at how inflation has evolved in the last year and a half. So to follow up, you're, so you're not willing to commit that the current levels of inflation and their persistence have met moderately and for some time. So uh, given that, I mean, how we should render, how should we render what moderately and uh, so, for, moderately over and for some time mean? What, what I'm really saying is that question is not before us right now. We're, 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 you know, we were, we had the question on when to taper. We've now answered that question and the speed of it and all that. We're not, we have not focused on whether we meet the liftoff test because we don't meet the liftoff test now because we're not at maximum employment. So Powell says, let's not talk about the liftoff right now because we haven't even discussed it. What are you talking about here? Are you saying that the Federal Reserve did not even discuss the possibility of lifting interest rates higher when we have central banks across the world? The Bank of England already talking about jacking interest rates higher. The Polish bank already jacking interest rates higher to respond to inflation. And pretty much every central bank across the world is already issuing guidelines regarding the liftoff of interest rates to combat inflation. The Fed says we haven't even talked about it because we have yet to achieve so-called maximum employment. So what is maximum employment, Mr. Powell? So we don't actually define maximum employment as we don't we define it in, in terms of inflation, but of course there is a connection there. Maximum employment has to be a level that is consistent with with stable prices. But uh, but that's not really how we think about it. We think about uh, inf maximum employment as looking at a broad range of things. You can't just look at unlike inflation where you can have a number. Uh, but with with maximum employment, you could ha you could be in a situation hypothetically where uh, where the unemployment rate is low, but, but there are many people who are out of the labor force and will come back in. And so you wouldn't really be at maximum employment because there's this group that isn't counted as unemployed. Uh, so, so we look at a range of things. And, I, you know, so by, the thing is, by many uh, measures, we are at a very tight labor market. I, men I mentioned quits and uh, job openings and wages and things like Many of them are signaling a tight labor market. But the issue is, the issue is, I don't have a clue, the slightest clue of what I'm doing right now. I have absolutely no clue. I'm a delusional madman obsessed with the performance of the stock market. That's all there is. He talks about the tightening of the labor market. 
the shortages. Admitting that the employment market is too hot, the man is dazed and confused. What about the labor shortage, Mr. Powell? What about employees quitting and staying at home? What about the labor participation rate? People are not even interested in working anymore. What about the fact that we have more jobs openings right now than people looking for a job? Yeah, so <clears throat> what's happening is people are leaving their jobs. They're quitting their jobs in uh, all-time high numbers. But in many cases, going back into employment and getting higher wages. So a lot of the higher wages you're seeing are for job switchers rather than incumbents. <clears throat> so that's just that's a sign of a, of a really strong labor market as opposed to people just running off and quitting. So here you are, Mr. Powell, admitting that the jobs market is too hot, that we have people quitting, having the luxury to quit, to stay at home and perhaps find another job, a better paying job. We have more jobs openings than those looking for one. Isn't this the definition of maximum employment in the economy? Why are you not at least, at a minimum, issuing a guideline for the lift off in interest rates? Why? And that's, that's because, our, as I mentioned, our policy has been adapting to the situation as it evolves, as it's clarifying itself. And that's partly because we see inflation be coming in higher. Uh, so. so, I have no clue what I'm talking about. So, what a delusional madman. Listen to this question. Confronting Powell, what if you're going to fall behind the curve here and you have to do a lot of catch-up? And by catch-up, we mean a lot of monetary tightening at a time where perhaps the economy will be slowing down, which will be a disaster, an epic disaster, nightmare scenario. What are you going to do about that, Mr. Powell? Thank you. We'll go to Mike McKee at Bloomberg. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the critics of your patience policy argue that given the long and variable lags with which monetary policy works, that you are likely to end up, given inflation, by having to raise rates faster and farther than you would have liked and therefore send the economy into recession. Given the fact that basically your forecast has been chasing inflation over the last year and now you're talking about it not coming down till the second or third quarter, why would they be wrong in thinking that? Well, so. Let me say. Uh, what's happened and we're very, very straightforward about it is that inflation has come in higher than expected and um, bottlenecks have have been more persistent and more prevalent, we see that just like everybody else does. And we see that they're now on track to persist well into next year. That was not expected, not expected by us, not expected by other macro forecasters. Now, let me say, you know, it's difficult enough to just forecast the economy in normal times. When you're talking about, you know, global supply chains in turmoil, it's a whole different thing. And you're talking about a, a pandemic that's holding people out of out of the labor force for reasons that we we can we can sample but we can't we don't have a lot of experience with this so it's very very difficult to forecast and and not easy to set policy so you are admitting that you have no clue at all what are you doing you're clueless you are a delusional madman yet you are conducting policies which will have severe ramifications in the future to the economy and to the future generation of Americans. You're conducting these policies, yet you have no understanding, no knowledge, no comprehension at all about what's going on with the economy. You're just rolling the dice. The man is dazed and confused, and on top of that, dangerous. The fact that he is that delusional makes him a dangerous man to lead the Federal Reserve, and he must be removed immediately. Listen to his answer when confronted about the crimes of the Federal Reserve, the financial crimes about Fed presidents, including himself, by the way. Listen to the weaseling around and the bullshitting. He sounds like a mob boss. No apologies, no admission of guilt, not even humility or any transparency. Chairman Powell, uh, Brian Chung, Yahoo Finance. So just to expand on the ethics conversation, uh, you talked about how you engage with people uh, on Capitol Hill and in the administration. You talked about what you've done already, but I'm just wondering if you could take a step back and just assess whether or not there was reputational damage as a result of that, either from the public's view or from the financial community's view of the Federal Reserve's independence? And then secondly, do you look back on the whole episode and have thoughts on your individual responsibility in preventing something like this uh, from having happened? So I, 
you know, it's. I think it's too soon to say what the reputational damage is. I think from the very beginning, uh, my reaction was we need to deal with this straightforwardly, transparently, and forcefully, and that's what we're going to do. I mean, it's. It, it, it means everything to me that we take do whatever it takes to to make sure that nothing like this happens again. And I, I like to think. We've made a real good start on that. If you think about it, you, you, you cannot execute a trade unless it's pre-cleared. And then you have, to, you have to say, execute. It's not even a trade. Really, really there's no trading going on. This is for investment uh, and you know, getting liquidity for life's expenses. But you then have to wait 45 days uh, to actually execute that, that sale or purchase. So I, I, th I think it's a pretty good system. We're, we'll always be looking to... Uh, to make it better. Uh, so in terms of our independence, you know, I, 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 I look, I think we, we will address this and I think we have, and I like to think it's enough, but it's going to, you know, we, we're, we're just beginning to implement it. We have to write the rules, which we're doing, you know, as quickly as possible. We need more people. We're going to have to resource this much more significantly here at the board. And also, we're going to need appropriate technology because, <clears throat> you know, we're going to, we have the Fed has more than system has more than thirty thousand employees. Not all of them, far far fewer of them will be will be covered by this. But the senior officers uh, who are who will be covered by this will you know will have to have techn technology access, and it's going to have to work efficiently. So there's a lot of work to do to to implement it. You know, I, again, I would just say, <clears throat> um, again, this is a garbage answer. Weaseling around, you don't need technology to stop committing crimes, Mr. Powell. You and your buddies can stop committing crimes right now. You're using insider information and your power of manipulating the market for personal gain. This is the definition of insider trading. This is a financial crime. None of you, not you, not Rosengren, not Kaplan, not Clarita, Nobody even had the humility to say, you know what, we're sorry about the appearance of conflict of interest. We're going to do better. We're going to act right now. We're going to change policies immediately. We're going to have independent watchdogs. None of that. We're waiting for the development of technology to stop us from committing crimes. Maybe we'll stop committing crimes once we're in the metaverse. I might be a shitty person in reality. But my avatar in the metaverse has a great social credit score. Next, let's move on to the elections in Virginia last night. A disaster for the Democrats and Joe Biden. The Republican won, by a lot of course, decisively, and the Republicans now recaptured Virginia. If you listen to the news media, they'll tell you it's all about education and uh, school curriculums or whatever. In reality, however, it is the economy stupid. Voters in Virginia ask, what is your top issue? More than a third of voters in Virginia said the economy and jobs were the most important issues in the state as the U.S. faces higher inflation and employers are fiercely competing for workers in a tight job market. You hear that, Mr. Powell? You hear that, Mr. Biden? Voters care about the economy, jobs, and inflation. The voters in Virginia and across the nation, by the way, voted by their wallets. They're paying more for gas. They're paying more for food. They're paying more in utility bills. They're paying more for child care. They're paying more for everything. And we continue to hear from corporate earnings every single day. Companies are jacking prices higher. Companies will continue to jack prices higher. Jerome Powell says, yeah, that's okay, because we have not achieved maximum employment. And therefore, I say, Joe Biden's and the Democrats' biggest enemy right now is Jerome Powell. The Democrats are a bunch of fools if they decide to keep Jerome Powell as the head of the Federal Reserve. He will push the United States and perhaps the globe into hyperinflation and then prepare for the Red Tsunami in 2022. Even though Jerome Powell is a Republican, by the way. When voters in Virginia ask, do you approve or disapprove of the agenda of Joe Biden? 53% said they strongly, excuse me, they disapprove. 44% said they strongly disapprove. Once again, what a disaster. And now we have even Manchin and McConnell. They both agree that voters back GOP candidates due to inflation. Inflation is the number one issue right now in the minds of voters. It impacts their livelihood directly right now. Not about the promises and the dreams, folks. It is what's impacting consumers and voters right now. And of course, Nancy Pelosi understanding the severity of the situation and the humiliating law and the defeat they got last night, she decided to share her trades 
with all Americans. No, just kidding. She decided the remedy is to include the paid leave plan back in the bill. So Nancy read this as voters not being appeased with the fact that the Democrats are bargaining and lowering all the promises that they promised during the campaign. They said, folks, if we're elected, if we have the majority, we're going to pass a paid leave plan. Every single civilized country in the world has paid leave plans, with exception of the United States of America. So we have one side, Manchin, reading it as inflation being the issue. The other side, the Pelosi side, says there's actually voters being displeased by the fact that we took family paid leave out of the bill. And the reality is both sides are right. When you promise something, you gotta deliver. You promised us paid leave, you gotta deliver. Number two, Inflation is an issue. You gotta control the spending, trim the waste. You gotta also control the monetary policy. You gotta revise the energy policy because gas prices are surging out of whack. And what goes around comes around. The rise in oil prices and natural gas prices impacts everything. Food prices, materials prices, transportation prices, shipping costs, everything goes higher. The numbers don't lie. This was a referendum on the issue of inflation. And the Democrats paid the price. The good news is, we're not in 2022 yet. If this was 2022, they would have lost both the House and the Senate. So they are panicking right now. But we know from history that the fiscal policy has limitations in controlling inflation. Inflation always, always has been a monetary phenomenon. And you heard from the delusional madman leading the monetary policy. He is delusional, a madman, dazed and confused. This man is a danger to the state of the economy. He must be removed right now. Next, let's talk about macro data that we got today, starting with the ADP report for private payrolls. The number we got is 571,000 jobs created in October. The ADP says, isn't this maximum employment, Mr. Powell? The private sector of the economy created over half a million jobs in a single month, indicating that perhaps the number we're about to get on Friday, the BLS, the non-farm payrolls, will probably be a blockbuster number, which will spark the discussion of the left off and in interest rates. You can weasel your way around, but the facts and the reality of the economy will catch up with you. Small businesses in the country created about 115,000 jobs, mid sized businesses created about 114,000 jobs, and large enterprises created about 342,000 jobs. When it comes to the goods producing sector of the economy, for mining and resources, 5,000 jobs, manufacturing, 53,000 jobs and for construction, 54,000 jobs were created in October. When it comes to the service sector of the economy, it created a stunning 458,000 jobs. When we look at the details, for example, we have 78,000 jobs for trucking, trade, transportation, 56,000 jobs in education and healthcare, 14,000 jobs in information, and the hottest sector of the economy right now, leisure and hospitality, created about 185,000 jobs. We also created 15,000 jobs in financial services and 88,000 jobs in professional and business services, and lastly, 22,000 jobs in the category of other services. We also got data from the ISM Manufacturing and Services PMI. Let's start with the services PMI. The number was stunning, indicating that the economy is still growing faster, at least in the services sector of the economy. As you can see, the number is growing faster. New orders are also growing faster. Inventories, however, are contracting faster. What does that mean? Orders are growing faster. Inventories nowhere to be found. What does that mean? We have a shortage. The shortage leads to prices surging out of whack, and therefore prices are also increasing at a faster rate. And of course, the backlog of orders naturally is also growing at a faster pace. This is an indicator that inflation is rising higher, but growth is still intact in the services sector of the economy. Now, what about manufacturing? What's going on with manufacturing? It is a different picture here. Perhaps we're seeing the stagflation phenomenon in manufacturing. New orders are slowing down. Production is also slowing down. Inventories are piling up faster. However, prices continue to increase faster, even as the backlog of orders is growing at a slower pace. What does that mean? We have a stagflationary element here in the manufacturing sector of the economy, where orders are slowing down, but prices continue to surge out of whack. If Powell remains in denial, then this will be contagious to the services sector of the economy, and then the entirety of the economy will fall under stagflation. For now, the good news is 
growth remains intact in the economy and therefore yields, at least in the 10 year, should shoot up higher. Will this be good for the growth and the momentum side of the stock market? Not really. But for now, the equities market remains in denial and complete delusion. Of course, the equities market will start to wake up from the pipe dream once interest rates on the 10-year reach 1.7-1.8%. Before we move on to the market's coverage, I want to answer a viewer's question here. The viewer says, I'm a new retail investor. Now, will the premium subscription at Morningstar Research help me or not? To answer this question, the research for Morningstar is impeccable. It is one of the top in the industry. The issue is, will it help you or not? To answer this question, I have to ask you another question. What are your goals? Do you want to make a quick buck, Christmas money, or do you want to invest in the long term for three, four, five years? Are you a high net worth retail investor with perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in the long run? Or do you want to invest about 10 grand? You want to make a quick buck before Christmas? Because the answer to these questions will determine whether you need the subscription or not, whether it's going to help you or not. Because if you follow the chief strategist at Morningstar, for example, their price target for Tesla is around 680 bucks. Where is the stock trading right now well above 1000 bucks so how will the fundamental research help you in your investment journey will we have a momentum driven market a liquidity driven market yes the fundamentals will always be supreme but in the short run momentum remains the leading factor in the market right now the leading driver in market moves right now let's say you're investing about ten thousand dollars and you want to make a quick buck perhaps making ten percent twenty percent before christmas then i would say the research for morningstar will not help you at all it will not be relevant for your goals. On the other hand, if your goal is to build a portfolio for three, four, five years based on the fundamentals, and you are investing a large sums of money, then the research for Morningstar will help you out because you will pick stocks in your portfolio based on the fundamentals. For example, back in the dot-com bubble, the hottest stock was Qualcomm. This is the equivalent of Tesla today. In the 1990s, all the way after the bubble popped, in 2000, the stock of Qualcomm gained over 2,000%. On the other hand, in orange, as you can see, the stock of Berkshire Hathaway gained about 15%. Did not do anything at all. At that time, Warren Buffett was called stupid, old, irrelevant, doesn't understand technology, doesn't understand the dot-com revolution. Warren Buffett did not even talk about it. He remained silent. He did not say anything at all. He continued to follow his principles in investing, following the fundamentals, looking at the action in Qualcomm as a fad, a hype that will come and go. When we fast forward from the point of the top in 2000, the top of the dot-com bubble, all the way till the present day, the returns from Berkshire Hathaway sitting at almost 1,000%. On the other hand, two decades later, the stock of Qualcomm only doubled from the top of the 2000 top. Do you want to follow the story of Qualcomm or do you want to follow the story of Berkshire Hathaway? It depends on your goals. If you want to follow the story of Qualcomm, then your timing has to be extremely good because you don't want to sit on 2,000% gains and then you lose it all when the stock turns around and the bubble ends. Timing the market is extremely difficult, by the way. When to get in, when to get out, specifically in a mania-driven market. If you are investing based on the principles of Warren Buffett, the fundamentals and the valuations, then you are in it in the long run. You're not looking to time the market. You're looking to invest pretty much forever in the long run and therefore you avoid the tragedy of market timing but we as retail investors we don't have the luxury of time sometimes and some of us don't have the money we don't have millions if not billions of dollars to buy stocks based on fundamentals based on value and receive dividends some of us need returns right away some of us need perhaps not outlandish 2000 percent gains but perhaps some of us are looking for 20 30 percent in a year or so therefore if that is your goal you have to follow the momentum them in the market. The risk is timing. If your timing is wrong and the stock turns around and the sentiment in the market turns around, you're going to be holding the bag. So you have to have the combination of both. And I'm not giving you any financial advice here, but looking at the charts, for example, look at the IWM. The chart has been consolidating for about a year. It had an incredible run last year. And after that, it has been consolidating in the range, not doing anything at all. Now, the chart is st starting to break out. All of that energy 
from the consolidation is being released to the upside, meaning that if this move in the Russell 2000 sticks, we're going to have higher highs. Now, the chart did not close the week yet, so we don't have a confirmation that the break happened, that the breakout is happening right now, but in all likelihood, it will. Here's another chart for the SMH, the semiconductor chips sector of the market. It has also been consolidating since the beginning of the year, and now it is starting to move higher, breaking away from the consolidation range to the upside meaning perhaps and in, more, in all likelihood we're going to have higher highs in the SMH. Absent of a severe reaction in the market, say raising interest rates abruptly, that could happen in the long run. For now, Powell says, I don't see anything at all. I'm going to have to wait for the disaster to happen and then I'm going to react. In the meantime, this will excite charts like this to explode higher. I showed you the IWM and the SMH. Now contrast that with the chart of the NDX, the NASDAQ, which has been going higher and higher and higher. The bullish trend is still intact in the NASDAQ. But the problem is, what if your timing is wrong? You buy now, the chart goes down to revisit the trend line, and you're already sitting on losses. And what do you know next year? The sentiment sours, the pace of economic growth, perhaps slowing down, inflation continues to rise, and now we're talking about raising interest rates, and the NASDAQ breaks the trend, the bullish trend, and starts trading to the downside. Now you're sitting at losses. On the other hand, the risk versus reward for the dormant charts of the Russell and the SMH breaking higher, moving away from the consolidation, I see it more rewarding than buying the NASDAQ right now. This is just my opinion. This is not financial advice. You're going to have to do your own homework. Anyhow, folks, we spent a lot of time here. Let's move on to the markets coverage right away, starting with the performance. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 104.95 points, or a gain of 0.29%. The Nasdaq also closing in the green by 161.98 points, or a gain of 1.04%. The S&P 500 also closing in the green by 29.92 points, or a gain of 0.65%. What about the sector's performance today, leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, consumer cyclicals? And no, we're not just talking about Tesla, by the way. The Russell 2000 outperformed today. Small cap stocks, apparel stocks, all exploding higher today, therefore leading the consumer cyclical sector of the market to lead the gains. And here it is at number two for the silver, healthcare. I continue to be impressed with the performance of healthcare. And then at number three for the bronze, we got consumer defensives. The two sectors of the market have been pitching to you in the last few days. Meanwhile, the laggard of the day is energy. Crude oil prices went down. We're going to discuss all of that in the futures analysis in a second. But before we do that, let's move on to the advance to decline ratios. The NYSE 69% advancing versus 28% declining. The NASDAQ 67% advancing versus 30% declining. The breadth remains good. The rally is more inclusive. It used to be limited to the big cap technology stocks. Now the rally is widening, and this is a good sign for the market because the gains are being led by the small caps, the cyclical side of the market. Moving on to futures, what's going on here? Let's start by natural gas prices. They're exploding higher, gains of over 5.5% today. And of course, when we talk about natural gas, we have ripple effects across the economy and across futures. For example, we talked about fertilizer stocks and the prices of fertilizers soaring higher due to the rise of natural gas prices. Natural gas is an input component for fertilizers. And here's what's going on from the reports we got from Mosaic and Nutrin, two of the largest companies providing fertilizers to farmers. Nutrin CEO says farmers spending big on fertilizers. Fertilizer costs have skyrocketed as high natural gas prices forced some European production plants to halt or curtail production. Fertilizer costs have skyrocketed as high natural gas prices, a key input, forced some European production plants to halt or curtail production. That is threatening to raise the cost of producing food at a time when energy and commodity inflation are already a concern. You hear that, Mr. Powell? The company is trying to boost potash output to keep prices from getting too costly for growers. Mosaic, the world's largest largest phosphate producer is also seeing a huge leap in demand. U.S. spot prices for potash and urea, a form of nitrogen fertilizer, have more than doubled this year according to Bloomberg's green markets. The rally is stoking fears farmers might pull back on purchases or shift more acres into crops that require less nutrients. For now, the reason why you're seeing these fertilizer stocks 
moving higher, rebounding higher after the losses from yesterday, is the fact that farmers have no choice but to pay the extra cost, meaning companies like Mosaic and other fertilizer producers have the pricing power. What are you going to do with a f as a farmer? You have no choice but to pay the extra cost for fertilizers. We know that we have a quasi-socialist system, a Venezuela-like system when it comes to farmers, with the government passing handouts to farmers. Therefore, they have no problem at all paying the extra cost. When we talk about investing in the inflation era, we have to pick stocks for companies that have the pricing power and an end customer who can afford and doesn't mind the extra cost. And this makes fertilizer stocks an excellent form of investment right now. Contrast that with another stock that I talk about in this channel all the time, Sun Opta or Oatly, oat milk producers. Now the prices of oats are surging out of whack, but producers of oat milk have to pay extra cost the input cost because oats futures at an all-time highs. Can they pass the extra cost to the end consumer? This is the million dollars question. The answer is not really because you have alternatives. If you are drinking oat milk, yes, you might be disappointed, but if prices surge out of whack, you have alternatives. You have coconut milk, you have soy milk, you have almond, and many other forms. When it comes to farmers and the use of potash, and fertilizers, they have no other choice. And changing to crops that use less fertilizers is not ideal either because it takes years and years to change the farmland from one crop to another. And it might not be good, by the way, in the long run could be damaging to the land. Anyways, we talked enough about natural gas and shit. That's a lot of shit talking. What about oil? What's going on with crude oil? Well, prices are diving down today, and there is a reason. The inventory's number came out too hot, and here are the details. The actual number is 3.29 million versus a forecast of 2.25 million. So the actual number exceeded the forecast by about 1 million. Now the previous reading was 4.267 million. What does that mean? I doubt that the dive down in crude oil prices was due to the inventory's number. I believe that we have two different readings here. You have the equities market versus the oil market, reading the stance of Jerome Powell and the Fed when it comes to inflation and tightening the monetary policy. The equities market on one hand is looking for an excuse to rally. We have inflows in the market right now, and they're just looking for assurances that PAL will not be aggressive in tightening by perhaps accelerating the rate of taper or raising interest rates abruptly. On the other hand, we have the oil market taking more of a mature stance that perhaps PAL, whether he wants or not, will have to take a hawkish stance with an aggressive taper and raising interest rates sooner and faster than expectations. And the betting markets, by the way, they're also pricing in a sooner rate hike. We're now moving to June. Perhaps before that, the betting odds are rising higher and higher and higher for an early hike in interest rates. We're not even talking about taper anymore. So we have the two contrasting takes from the equities market and the oil market. Which one will be proven right? We will see. If the equities market continues to rally, then the oil market will look and say, you know what? If the equities market doesn't care, then why should I care? And we will see crude oil prices surging higher. There are some looking at Powell's statement as hawkish. Why would he announce a December taper on top of the November taper? On the other hand, we have another side of the market that looks at the statement as dovish, with Powell being vague, not giving any guideline about the lift off in interest rates. It continues to beat the drum on transitory. It's going to be transitory. It's going to be alleviated. Which side will win at the end? It all depends on the flow of data. On Friday, we're about to get the non-farm payrolls. You want to talk about maximum employment. What about the non-farm payrolls? What if the number come out exceeding 800,000 jobs, perhaps a million jobs? Then the market will start to panic that we're getting close closer and closer to raising interest rates. Forget about taper. The Fed will get caught with their pants down. They're already behind the curve. Anyhow, we talked enough about natural gas and crude. Let's move back to the futures. Crude oil prices are down big. The WTI down over 4.5%. Brent down about 4%. What about softs? We have a rally in lumber. In lumber rallies, when crude oil prices go down and grains go down, grains and energy are tied together via natural gas and crude oil prices. Lumber rallies when energy and grains are not. This has been the pattern, at least as of late. We have a rally in lumber of about 5% today, followed by cotton and coffee futures, while we have losses led by cocoa, OJ, and sugar. What about metals? Gold down. No relief here. No love for gold at all. Silver on the flat line. 
So is platinum, copper, and palladium. Muted activities, nothing happening at all, but the mature guy in the room, gold, is diving down by over 1%. Is gold saying that the US dollar is about to pop higher? That could be the case. What about meats? We have a rally for live cattle, feeder cattle, and lean hogs futures. All surging higher today. I believe that meat prices will continue to go higher and higher and higher. What about grains? Prices are retreating here for the majority of futures. Taking a break, oats down, canola down, wheat, corn, soybean oil, soybeans all down. The only grain futures closing in the green, soybean meal with about 1% gain. On the other hand, rough rice closing at the flat line. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? At number one, Tesla back on top, the souffle, with about one and a half million contracts trading today, about 52% of those were calls. At number two, we have Apple with about one million contracts, about 73.5% of those were calls. At number three, AMC with about 900,000 contracts traded today, about 78% of those were calls. And bear in mind that the speculative retail options mania is back the headline reads the speculative retail stock options traders are back in droves sundial says and notice that the volume peaked earlier in the year but it is forming this triangle pattern and perhaps we're about to have a breakout higher the mania is back the buying call options like crazy moving stocks like tesla and the meme stocks that we know amc gamestop cost bed bath and beyond all exploding higher be it they closed at the lows of the day so we'll see how sustainable this mania is because every other indicator we have, the retail crowd is more hesitant now than before. I shared the information with you that retail is actually buying ETFs this time around. They're not stampeding and buying the mania meme stocks but we'll see there are two sides of the retail crowd we have the mom and pop investors buying etfs and then we have the robin hoodiots and the crypto maniacs chasing meme stocks and tokens oh and by the way another sign of the mania spacs are making a comeback yep scams excuse me spacs are making a comeback we have the highest issuance of spacs since mosh so we will see if this is the revival of the mania or is this just one peak one pop before the mania goes bust and before we move on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today let's visit the tesla options grid specifically for calls and let's see if the mania is still intact well the volume is way down they're now eyeing the 1250 calls will they be successful in pushing the stock all the way to 1250 we'll see but the volume is way down and the reason is the implied volatility is out of whack they're paying top dollar for weekly expiration options the risk versus reward is not worth it at all here and here it is the unusual activities that took place in the options market today starting with the ticker adt for you guessed it ADT they're buying calls on the name the 10 bucks calls for the expiration date November 19th with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 11% or so they paid about 40 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 1.2 million dollars and here it is the IWM they're buying calls they're seeing the breakout same charts you and I are looking at and they're buying the 254 calls for the expiration date December 17th with the expectations that the Russell 2000 could pop higher by more than six and a half percent by then they paid about one buck and 35 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 1.7 million dollars and what about the trade for the ticker nke nike they're buying calls the 190 calls for the expiration date december 17th with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 10 percent or so by then they paid about one buck and 15 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about one million dollars what about the trade for the ticker spy the s p 500 they're buying puts here the 436 puts for the expiration date december 10th with the expectations that the spy could drop down by more than six percent by then and they paid about two bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all they paid about two million dollars and in all likelihood this is an insurance trade not a bet against the spy what about the trade for the ticker uvxy this is a proxy for the vix they're buying calls here for the expiration date of friday are we going to see a pop before the end of the week we'll see but they're buying the 17 calls for the expiration date this upcoming friday and they paid about 10 cents a piece to enter 
This trade, all in all, spending about $100,000. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the trade for the ticker FUTU? I'm not swearing at you. This is the ticker for FUTU. FU2. They're buying calls, the 65 calls for the expiration date, December 17th with expectations that the name that i'm not going to repeat by the way could pop higher by more than eight and a half percent by then they paid about six bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about four and a half million dollars lastly what about the trade for the ticker bgfv big five sporting goods retail stocks are making a comeback macy's is the hottest stock hottest stock right now yep macy's and here we have another one in big five they're buying calls the 35 calls for the expiration date december 17th with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 10 percent the name is already out of whack one of the top performing stocks in the russell 2000 you see the correlation here they're betting retail stocks higher which happen to be in the iwm anyhow they bought the 35 calls for the expiration date december 17th with expectations that the stock will pop higher by more than 10 percent and they paid about five bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about two and a half million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here the action is all over the place but i continue to be impressed with the performances of healthcare and consumer defensives the action in energy fluctuates depending on the prices of crude oil. The action in industrials fluctuates based on the action in the dollar index. Likewise, the action in materials also fluctuate, fluctuates based on the action in the dollar. Now, financials and tech also fluctuate based on the action in the 10-year yield. On the other hand, healthcare and consumer defensives remain steady eddy. A lot of names in consumer defensives and healthcare already reported earnings. And you know what? They have the pricing power and they are exercising the pricing power. And the consumer for now remains receptive. These are the kind of stocks you want to be in right now. Notable activities, of course, regarding to earnings. We're not going to cover earnings today because we have a lot of them. Perhaps if we don't have any action tomorrow in the market, then we're going to cover all earnings together for today and tomorrow. But we're seeing names moving based on earnings. For example, the ticker EMR, Emerson, down big today. We have other names that reported earnings today. They're also down or up big, depending on how good the earnings were. CVS, for example, shooting up higher today we have another notable activity here in deer the ticker de the name is diving down and the reason is we don't have a deal the uaw strike continues to go on and union members rejected the latest offer from deer which i thought was generous but labor has the power why not exercise the power to maximum this will be contagious of course because if deer employees strike and they succeed in getting 15 20 percent raise then guess what other companies will do the same lastly notice the performance of apparel stocks whether we're talking about stores or manufacturers the likes of vfc or even tj max the ticker tjx all surging higher today these are big components of the russell 2000 anyhow we're moving on to the charts analysis starting with the spy 30 minutes chart Heading into the day, we had the bull flag pattern. The bull flag is breaking out after the Powell statement, the Powell conference. The market wanted to hear what it wanted to hear. It wanted to pop higher. The Russell 2000 was already popping higher in the morning. The market already decided it's going to rally regardless of what Powell is about to say. Is it a knee-jerk reaction? We'll see. For now, all we know, the algos liked what they heard from Jerome Powell. We will know if this is a knee-jerk reaction or not by watching the dollar and the 10-year yield. If both of them pop higher, then the so-called pop and the ratty will reverse in the market, in the equities market, the SPY and the NASDAQ. But for now, we don't have any reversal signal whatsoever. The market is looking higher. It wants to go higher. The flows are still intact. The algos are excited. Everything is building on for higher highs until and unless we get the reversal signal. For now, the support remains at 454. Why is the support so far? The reason is the reversal will be in the form of a flush down. The revisit of 454 will happen rapidly, perhaps in a day, and therefore I keep the support level conservative for now. Moving on to the daily chart for the continuous contract and the SPY, the S&P 500. What's going on here? Again, the flows continue. The vertical line, ratty higher, goes on, even though the momentum indicators are highly extended right now. The market at the risk of any disappointment, any bad news that the market decides to take seriously will result in a flush down candle. For now, we have 
had one false reversal signal, the shooting star, which sucked a lot of bears, including me, by the way. And now they're forced to cover. We get a nice warm pie in the face. Now, don't get me wrong, I like pie. Not in my face, though. And therefore, I'm not gonna bet against this until the reversal signal happens. For now, is there any point to talk about support? Of course not. The support remains of 4,549.5. If my call is right, that we're gonna see a flush down candle when the reversal happens, then we will go down and revisit 4,549 quickly. Moving on to the NASDAQ daily chart, similar story here. The flows are pretty much identical. They're buying big cap technology names. They're buying the SPY, they're buying the Qs, and therefore the charts look pretty much identical. We had the bull flag, the bull consolidation, and the chart exploded higher after the PAL conference. And you see the big columns in volume, these are algos buying right away. They liked what they heard. Is it a knee-jerk reaction once again? Who knows? We have to wait and look at the dollar and yields. These are the two leading indicators. For now, the actual support is way down at 372. I don't see any soft support that will prevent the flush down scenario. I see the chart going down rapidly when the reversal happened. Do we have a reversal now? Of course not. Nothing is leading or looking at the chart right now is suggesting that we have a reversal coming. When we look at the daily chart, the momentum indicators are highly extended, suggesting the risk of a flush down can imminent. What is the spark though? We don't have a spark yet. On top of that, the sentiment in the market remains hyper bullish. What do I mean by that? I mean we got bad news from the Virginia elections, for example, which could impact the spending bill. We have a lesser bill, a smaller bill in infrastructure. This will be bad for the stock market because the market has been rallying higher in anticipation of a three trillion plus in spending, where the likelihood now the spending bill will shrink to about one and a half to one trillion. But the market wants to hear what it wants to hear. The market says, yep, we have a loss in Virginia. Perhaps it will impact the spending negatively. But who cares for now? We have to wait till it actually happens. Till the bill passes and it comes out disappointing. And then we're going to throw a fit. We're not going to throw a fit now, right now, with Jerome Powell being delusional and behind the curve. We have to wait for the disaster to happen. And then we're going to react. This is the delusional nature of the market right now. The other argument would say, wait a minute here, a smaller spending bill will actually be good for the NASDAQ. Why? Because inflation expectations go down. The market was worried about a higher spending bill which will drive inflation higher. And therefore, the Nasdaq is rallying on legitimate reasons. My counter argument is, well, inflation is already here. Inflation is already growing higher. Look at every indicator, whether it is the ADP, the wage inflation, the ISM manufacturing, the ISM services index, all pointing out to prices surging higher. More spending from the fiscal side will only add fuel to the fire. Less spending will not prevent the outlook for inflation. Inflation is already here, it will continue to go higher and higher and higher because inflation is a reaction to the money printing. It is a lagging reaction to the massive money printing that we got last year and it will continue to go on until it finishes its course. And oh, by the way, yields actually popped higher after the conference from Powell. So I feel that the NASDAQ is delusional right now, rallying higher even as interest rates also surging higher. And this is, of course, due to the flows. The algos are buying. The flows are massive. 25 plus billion dollars into ETFs, the SPY and the NASDAQ, buying big cap technology names, regardless of earnings, regardless of interest rates, regardless of everything. Put your blindfolds on and buy, buy. Buy. The next support we have will be around 15,192 if my outlook of a flush down candle will happen. It's not going to happen in a day, but a flush down candle erases three or four daily candles and then followed by another one. It will perhaps face a reaction around 15,192, 15,200, and that will be indeed a bull trap because people are buying right now. People are buying at these levels, at these highly extended levels, of course, the money managers, they have no ethics at all. All what they care about is their bonuses. We want to push the market higher because we were looking for Christmas bonuses. Who cares if the clients buy at the top or not? Just give us our money. Moving on to the IWM 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Breaking out, we had a bull flag followed by another bull flag. And the IWM, the Russell 2000, continues to explode higher. Everybody's noticing the move. Everybody's noticing the consolidation, and now the sky is the limit. Of course, the support remains 
at around 233. When we zoom out to a daily chart for the RUT, the Russell 2000, the big one, all of this consolidation since the beginning of the year, within a range, a defined range, is being broken to the upside. This is the first time where the RUT, the Russell 2000, is breaking above 2360. This is the first time. If it closes the week above that level, then we have a confirmation that the IWM is breaking out higher. Is this bullish or is this bearish for the market? The answer is, it is bullish. Does it make sense? It doesn't have to. We're heading into a tightening cycle in the monetary policy. It doesn't make sense for the IWM to pop higher. But the technicals are not lying here, folks. What about the Dixie, the dollar index? What's going on here? It went up, it went down, and pretty much closing within range. It is keeping the support of 93.7. It is within range. The support, 93.7. The resistance, 94.7. My assumption is, looking at the action from crude oil, looking at the action from gold, all diving down, are they a leading indicator that the dollar is about to pop higher? We're looking at other currencies when central banks tighten in Australia, Canada, even Israel. All of these currencies popped higher. My take from Powell's statement today, he is tightening. Yes, he is delusional, but he is tightening. We have taper. Taper is happening right now. We have another round of taper next month, and then another one, and another one, and another one. And the risk is, what if he decides to rush the taper timeline? This is the risk that we have right now, the immediate risk for the market. And this will indeed push the dollar significantly higher. What about gold? What's going on here with gold? Nothing is going on. It is struggling. It is keeping the support, the Fibonacci support, at least for now. The assumption is it's not going to be able to hold for any longer. It's going to go down to 1,680, 685, doesn't matter. I will buy with both hands if it goes down there. What about the 10-year treasury yield? What's going on here? Popping higher. Again, the NASDAQ, the equities market popped higher. They're getting excited by Powell's statement, but so is the yield, the 10-year. Also popping higher. At some point, we get to 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, You think the rally in the NASDAQ would be sustainable? Of course not. The valuation is out of whack. And even for the IWM, by the way, I showed you that the Russell 2000 value index is also in bubble territory. We don't even have value in this market. So the surge in interest rates remains the immediate threat for the market. The abrupt tightening of the monetary policy. And by the way, the bond market can do that for Powell. Powell doesn't have to announce jacking interest rates higher. The bond market could do that for him. Once again, a closure above 1.5% for the week will strengthen the position that yields are going higher. What about the weekly chart for the TLT? What's going on here? Again, reversing, struggling to break above 149. I don't see a scenario here for the TLT to pop higher. You saw the numbers from the services PMI. You saw the numbers from the ADP. And you're going to see the numbers from the non-farm payroll report unless the cooks do a great job. All of these are indicators that yes, inflation is surging higher, but so is growth in many corners of this economy right now. Growth remains intact in the majority of corners in the economy. Perhaps manufacturing is falling down and it's going to be contagious, but for now, growth remains intact. Moving on to the VIX 4 hours chart, what's going on here? This remains a spot-on indicator. The negative crossing in the MACD indicator was the leading sign the SPY is about to pop higher. The problem is the VIX is now at the bottom. It is at the support of 15. Every time the VIX went down to 15, it pops right back. The resistance at 20, the support at 15. If the VIX breaks 15 and closes below 15 for the week, then we have another different phenomenon going on here. The Russell is about to pop higher. The options gambling mania is back the SPAC mania is back everybody's stampeding buying technology stocks for now we'll take it one day at a time because what we're seeing right now in the market and the indices could be a knee-jerk reaction we should wait for a confirmation and we should wait for how the market will react on friday after the non-farm payrolls moving on to apple daily chart what's going on here recapturing 150 for support the inflows in ETFs, specifically the NASDAQ, is aiding Apple to pop higher. The problem is, when you look at Apple individually, you're not seeing any rise in implied volatility or any action, any indicator that we're seeing organic buying of Apple shares. Everything is riding higher via ETFs buying. Moving on to Tesla, what's going on here? 30 minutes chart, the trend remains intact, and now it is battling the all-time highs once again. I showed you the options market grid, we're losing some energy here. On the other hand, Tesla was down early in the morning, what was outperforming? The answer is, 
GME, AMC were popping significantly higher, the meme stocks. The moment meme stocks cooled down, we saw Tesla moving back higher. The immediate risk for Tesla right now is a distraction from other hotter stocks and hot hotter options. We know the implied volatility is already too high for Tesla. The premiums are too expensive. The risk versus reward is not worth it anymore. When you buy a call option out of the money, costing you $1,200 with the expiration date in three days or two days, it is not worth it. It is highly risky right now. On the other hand, we have other distractions, newer meme stocks with suppressed implied volatility with the potential for squeeze rally which could produce 500 a thousand two thousand percent gains the kind of gains that the options market crowd is looking for in tesla that opportunity was last week now you're seeing the gains 50 percent 60 percent 80 percent while the stock is exploding four five six percent a day it's not worth it anymore moving on to tulips btc what's going on here this is the two hours chart we have another wtf rescue operation of course we have one of these candles they flush down and right away we see somebody buying whatever is going on here in the tulip market it is a swamp who cares but when we zoom out to the daily chart perhaps we're seeing a reverse head and shoulder formation which will allow tulips and btc in this case to pop higher above 65,000. it could happen the energy is still here you're seeing every time btc dips down an inflow of buyers buy the dip right away what does that mean the energy is still intact in cryptos be it btc be it ethereum but forget about the coins the meme coins doge shiba these are pumps and dumps but these large coins the energy is still intact here moving on to amc here we go here we go beautiful 30 minutes chart popping higher respecting the numbers by the way look at the accuracy of the resistance and support lines to the penny it went all the way to the resistance of 42 and a half it pulled back it peaked a little bit above that, but it pulled back all the way to the support of 39, almost to the penny. Either the algos are following exactly what I'm doing, or the apes are following me. Even though I'm accused of being anti-ape, but who else on YouTube covering the chart of AMC on daily basis with extreme accuracy, by the way? And here is a bonus chart for Ferrari. Morgan Stanley says, forget about Tesla. The hottest name in EVs is Ferrari, the ticker race, R-A-C-E. Here is the chart exploding higher. Pretty much every EV manufacturer, the charts are exploding higher, be it Tesla, be it Ford, be it GM. Oh, wait a minute. It's not GM. Just Tesla and Ford. And here's another one. The question is, do we have a reverse? of today it appears so the rsi is way overextended we have a reversal candle popping higher gap and crap at a high volume the highest volume since february if this is not a reversal then i don't know what is moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the earnings calendar tomorrow we have toyota moderna skyworks square expedia airbnb kellogg's alibaba uber peloton fortinet explosive day by far the most important day in earnings this week and forgive me of course for not covering earnings today we will do a catch-up perhaps in tomorrow's video lastly what do we have on the economic calendar we have another indicator that will be watched closely since Powell is talking about maximum employment, let's take a look at the initial jobless claims, the weekly jobless claims. If they fall further, then we're getting closer and closer and closer to maximum employment. We also have unit labor cost. This will be important, an important indicator regarding the wage inflation phenomenon in the economy right now. Anyhow, folks, that's all I got for you for now. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.